You have to see this video. <laughs> you have to visit my Slavonia. You have to visit our national parks. You have to taste our food. You have to learn the game in the local playground like we did. And see the great cannon fire off in my city. Zagreb. You will never walk alone on these hiking trails. Croatia, full of life. and welcome to the 20th International Conference for Integrated Care. Padraz i Dobdovshli na Conferencio. My name is Fiona Line and I am the Director of Communications for the International Foundation for Integrated Care. Today we are coming to you live from the Foundation's office on Valencia Island in the southwest of Ireland and from the offices of the Health Centre Zagreb in Croatia. Our Irish office is based here in the Transatlantic Cable Station where over 150 years ago, the first communication link was made by cable across the Atlantic Ocean, connecting for the first time Europe and North America, and then the rest of the world. So it's poignant that once again, over a century later, we are able to connect over 1,000 people representing more than 50 countries and all the time zones of the world from the same building. While our friends in North and Latin America are watching the sunrise, our friends in the Asia Pacific region are almost finished their day. Thank you all for joining and we hope you have a worthwhile experience and enjoy connecting with your colleagues from across the globe. We, can, we know it can never be the same as face to face, but we hope this virtual experience is a very close second. First off, I would like to take this early opportunity to give a big thank you to our gracious hosts, the health centres at Greb, with Antonia Balinovic, Van Jalacic and Van Verkik Sola. We were very excited to travel to the beautiful town of Shivanik last April, and it was so disappointing to have to postpone the conference and ultimately cancel the physical edition of the event. It would have been our first conference to take place in Central Europe. Hopefully we'll have the chance to go there again soon. It's hard to think back where we were last March, only weeks out from the conference, when the world as we know it changed and health and care systems all over the world kicked into top gear to respond to the oncoming pandemic. IFIC recognises the extraordinary pressures that the crisis has imposed on health and care systems all over the world, especially on system managers and frontline staff. We would like to take this moment to send our best wishes to all those people and communities from all over the world who have been impacted by COVID-19. 
Moving the conference to a virtual offer was made easier by the support that IFIC and the ICIC20 organising committee received from our fantastic network. We now have over 25,000 connections from 80 countries and our hubs are growing at a fantastic rate. The 400 or so speakers, poster presenters, workshop organisers, special interest group coordinators, with a special mention to Anne Hendry and Mandy Andrews, our board and hub leads who were so patient as we worked out the logistics of moving to a virtual platform. Thank you so much for your understanding and your generosity. Of course, all of this was only made possible by our conference partners, Abby. Abby conferences through Mariah Cran and her colleagues, Emma Conlon and Iva Brankovic. They have been phenomenal throughout. But learning how to use the new software, communicating with the delegates and speakers and keeping us all on track. Essentially organizing a whole new event and a whole new format in a short few months. Thank you all. Of course, it wasn't just this conference that has been impacted. We should right now be in the lead up to our first North America conference, which was due to take place in Toronto in October. And that too has been postponed until next year. And our next conference, the 21st conference on integrated care was due to take place in Antwerp next May, and now has been postponed to 2023. This makes our next physical conference, hopefully, um, to take place in Odense in Denmark in 2022. You will find out more about these conferences and also our plans for a spring virtual event during the closing ceremony on the 30th of September. The other major project to keep an eye out for is the launch of our Integrated Care Online Academy. And our first digital certificate in Integrated Care is now in development with the first cohort of students expected to start in January 2021. Finally, I want to highlight that we are joined today by almost 100 patients and carers from all over the world and 200 delegates from our host country, Croatia. Welcome, and we look forward to engaging with you all both throughout this conference and into the future. That's it for me for now. I wish you all a fantastic conference. Remember to share your experience of the conference through social media. We will be using the hashtags Integrated Care and ICIC20 Virtual, and we encourage you to do the same so we can coordinate our messages. Please make use of all the functionalities on offer in the portal. You'll find out all about them shortly. And if you need any help, just contact us and we will do our best. I'll hand you over now to our chairman, Philip Davies to say a few words. Philip? Yeah, okay, thank you Fiona um, and uh, Strava and welcome everybody to the ICIC20 virtual edition. Um, I'm speaking to you, I'll leave you to guess where I'm speaking to you from. Um, firstly, I'd uh, like to uh, begin by acknowledging uh, and echoing um, Fiona's thanks to our partners and our hosts, um, the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Croatia, the City of Zagreb, the Health Centre Zagreb, Croatian Academy of Arts and Sciences, the University of Zagreb, Libertas International University, and the Catholic University of Croatia. Um, and again, I'd like to echo Fiona's thanks uh, to the entire IFIC team, uh, the team at Abbey Conferences, and indeed everyone on the organising committee who's been working so hard um, on the development of this conference since early 2019. Um, I'm sure many of us were looking forward to meeting face to face in the beautiful city of Šibenik earlier this year um, but as we're all too painfully aware that wasn't possible um, so our colleagues and the organizing team have worked incredibly hard uh, they have literally been meeting every week since March to get us to where we are today um, about to embark on an exciting innovative virtual conference it has been an amazing effort and I'm sure we'll all appreciate what they have achieved as the conference proceeds over the next four weeks. It's been almost 18 months since IFIC's last international conference and during that time a number of new members, myself included, joined the IFIC board. At the same time several long-serving members came to an end of their terms and I'm sure you all wish to join me virtually in thanking them for their many contributions that have helped to make IFIC what it is today. The current board brings a wide range of skills and experience to the foundation and is appropriately diverse from both a gender and geographic perspective. And in September last year, uh, those members chose to elect me as chair, a role which I was indeed honoured to accept. 
IFIC and the wider integrated care network with which we're all associated in some way has achieved a lot over the past 18 months since we were last all together. Just a few examples, the, the IFIC R&D team led by Leo Lewis has successfully completed a number of research projects, including one known as SUSTAIN, which aimed to improve the way care services for older adults, especially those with multiple health and social care needs, improve the way those services are organised and delivered across Europe. And we've continued our involvement as IFIC in EU funded projects in a number of other areas, best practice models for sustainable integrated care, procurement and tendering practices, citizens secure access to and sharing of health across health data across borders, better data to advance research, disease prevention and personalised health and care, and digital tools for citizen empowerment and person-centred care. They just give you a flavour of the diversity of the areas in which our R&D team have been working. Also earlier this year, we kicked off two other very exciting new EU projects, Value Care, which aims to deliver personalised integrated health and social care services and better outcomes for older people. It also aims to improve staff satisfaction and efficiency um, in the use of resources and coordination of care. And a second example of a new project is ProCare for Life, that's seeking an integrated, scalable and interactive eco ecosystem of care that can easily be adapted to a number of chronic diseases, care institutions and end user needs with obviously benefits uh, for patients, for caregivers and for health professionals. In addition to those exciting R&D projects, IFIC's also been commissioned uh, to deliver a broad range of evaluation, case studies and reviews uh, spanning the globe with clients from Ireland um, all the way to New Zealand. There are many more and if you want to hear more about these projects and others that IFIC's been involved in, then you'll have the opportunity to do so uh, by attending workshops and presentations across the four days of the conference. The journal, the International Journal of Integrated Care, continues to grow in impact. The new impact factor is now 2.753, announced earlier this year. And a big thank you to Susan Royer for her continued efforts as managing editor, and to the editors-in-chief, Victoria Stein, Nick Goodwin and Robin Miller. You can join the journal team in one of the breakouts later today in fact, where they'll be sharing tips and tricks for getting published. Hopefully that'll help you to get published so that you can actually help to boost that all-important impact factor. Can we get to three by the next conference, I ask. I mentioned that IFIC was part of a network and we've seen the IFIC hubs grow, the IFIC hubs grow from strength to strength with the hubs in Scotland, Australia, Ireland and Canada all having huge impact in their regions supporting advances in integrated care policy and practice for their populations. You'll have noticed that those are all Anglophone countries, Canada notwithstanding, um, but we're delighted to say that IFIC Latin America is now in development and there's been lots of work going on behind the scenes to line up the launch of that hub um, in, the, in the coming year and that will obviously be a, a move into a, an entire new sphere. Without spending too much time focusing on COVID-19 before we move into the first plenary, I do want to remind everyone of the huge resources that are available through the IFIC website, signposting the amazing work that's taken place all over the world to pivot health and care services towards a more community-based population approach, scaling up and amplifying the use of digital technology and relying on the health and care workforce to quickly transform and adapt to new ways of working. Our dedicated COVID-19 space on the IFIC website, uh, you, can, you can download our thought leadership report, realising the true value of integrated care beyond COVID-19. And you can catch up on our webinar series, which took place in association with our hubs throughout uh, the period of, of lockdown. I know that many listening and viewing today um, work to actually deliver health and social care on the front line. And I know that you will have faced many, many challenges over the past few months. Not just those on the front line, uh, but also those fulfilling no less vital managerial and leadership roles in keeping our health systems and services wherever in the world they are, 
keeping those vital systems and services running and running successfully. And on behalf of the entire IFIC community, I think we want to recognise those efforts from around the globe and thank, sincerely thank, humbly thank and congratulate all of those involved. There's no doubt that the current pandemic has provided us with wonderful examples of the essential values of solidarity and international cooperations. Those are values which, in our own modest way, the global integrated care community seeks to live by, solidarity and international cooperation. Sadly, they're also values which sometimes seems to be under threat in parts of the world today, which makes all of our work that much more important. Finally, before I hand over to Orla back in Ireland for some housekeeping, I'd like to give a special mention to you, uh, to our growing network, our friends from IFIC around the world, who are leading special interest groups, supporting hubs, working with us on our education training offers, especially those supporting our Integrated Care Online Academy, those who are reviewing papers for this conference and regularly for our journal, or simply getting out there, spreading the word and promoting our work. You'll meet many of those friends and colleagues over the course of this conference as they chair special, as they chair sessions and lead special interest group meetings. And to each and every one of those colleagues, um, you're very much valued and appreciated. And to all of you who have joined us for the conference over the next four sessions, uh, you are very welcome. Uh, your support and involvement is very much appreciated. And I hope you all have an interesting, stimulating and enjoyable conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, that was great. So my name is Orla Snook O'Carroll and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager here at IFIC. You might see me pop up throughout the conference with bits and bobs of information. And also I'll be sharing some notes and some chats with Fiona throughout the course of the conference about the amazing speakers and plenary sessions that we have for you. So today I'd just like to say a few things about housekeeping from a platform point of view. So if you haven't already, please check out the explainer video, which is in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, if you click on your profile, which is the circle with your photograph in it or your initials, you'll be able to see the video there. And um, if you need any technical help, please press on the live support button. There's also a help button up there on the right hand corner of your screen as well. And that will be able to bring you to any kind of frequently asked questions or anything like that. And um, make sure to take notes during any sessions and email them and export them to yourself. Uh, during lunch breaks, please visit our virtual exhibitions and our poster galleries where you can download and view all the posters. Um, at the end of the day today, we'll have a networking session. This is really exciting. We'll have a chance to connect with other delegates for 10 minutes and it's selected at random. So you might meet someone who you've never met before. Um, all sessions will be recorded so and they'll be available via this platform at the end of the week. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand you back over to Fiona and she'll introduce our fantastic Croatian partners. Thanks, Orla. So to get us going and get us right into the programme of the conference, I'm going to hand over to Antonio Balinovic, who is in the Health Centre Zagreb. Welcome, Antonia. Thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, I'm very uh, happy on behalf of a local host organizer, Herkel Center Zagreb, and uh, also to our co-organizers to wish you warm welcome to Croatia. Unfortunately, we are not able to gather here physically, uh, but uh, thanks to digital technology and to ethics, we, we managed we still manage to organize this conference, uh, hopefully not only uh, challenging in a technical aspect, but also it will hopefully it will be interactive and also interesting. It is my special honor to announce the welcome greetings and the first on behalf of the city of Zagreb, our major Mr. Milan Bandic to address and to welcome you all. <laughs> virtuali conferenze 
интегрира, о интегриране скрби која се одржава во главното град на Република Хрватска. Добро дошли у град кој живи здравствени на стандард и кој живи највеќа социјална светлост и социјална солидарност во сите европски метрополи. Добро дошли у град кој мери човек. Добро дошли у град кој жели да квали ти сина преку тисуќи судионика во виртуалните конференции од интегрирани скрби која има едно темелно задачу. Живеќи у времену ковида пандемија и дека заштита сија предувети особено заштите пединца. Добро дошли у град кој ќе се задоволно организира тиу. 20-ту јубилатну меѓународну конференција во интегрирани скрби, која ќе у конечници обошати добрата учиковитост како здравствени, тако и социјално. Хвала вам и добро дошли у Загреб. And now, on behalf of our organizer, Ministry of Health, uh, I would like to uh, welcome, uh, to pronounce welcoming speech, which will be given by our uh, State Secretary, Dr. Jacob Plazanić. Dear participants and organizers, on behalf of the Croatia as the host country and the Ministry of Health, I am honored to greet you at the 20th International Conference on Integrated Care. Despite being held virtually due to the COVID-19 epidemic, the value of the conference has not been diminished, but rather amplified for its importance and value in these challenging times for all health systems. I would like to thank the organizers for encouraging the holding of this conference under such a specific conditions and for gathering such respectable number of participants which contributes to improving the integration of care and improving the quality of life of the patients and their families. The need for integrated care has arisen due to the complexity of providing health and social services. This has been recognized in many health systems, including the one of Republic of Croatia, and is of particular importance for vulnerable groups, groups such as children, the elderly people with disabilities and palliative patients. We all have the responsibility to establish integrated care or its horizontal and vertical connection, connection of the health system with other systems, especially with the social care system that defining community service providers education of all stakeholders in integrated models, and finally, IT connections and the data exchange capabilities. Furthermore, coordination among service providers is crucial in order to improve the care and treatment of patient as patients as well as ride the overall quality of life of patients and their families facing incurable and advanced diseases. This includes also finding optimal solutions to meet the social, psychological and spiritual needs of service users. It is especially important to stress the importance of the integrated healthcare of the elderly with an emphasis on the provision of inpatient healthcare in social care homes, which implies an existence of a strong connection between health and social systems, mutual exchange of data and coordination of users' care, which is crucial at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish you a successful conference, plenty of constructive discussions and conclusions that will contribute to the development of the new models and solutions in interconnecting service providers to improve treatment and care. And finally, I wish us all to meet soon in person at the next conference on the integrated healthcare. And it is my also special pleasure to announce the introductory plenary presentation on the topic use of cultural programs to promote health in the context of uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Horticulture and other social programs in Croatia 
will be held by the Minister of Culture, Dr. Nina Obolikozhnek. Dear participants of the ICIC 20 virtual conference, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you and to uh, speak to you today in uh, really uh, extraordinary circumstances. Um, I guess we are all getting used to this uh, online conferences uh, without having an audience, but I hope that uh, in front of you, but I hope that somehow uh, all the speakers that will be participating today and in the coming days will be able to attract your attention and we we'll, will be able to um, attract and uh, um, provoke lively discussions about the topics that are really timely and relevant. Um, what brings me as speaker at this conference is uh, probably one of the reasons is unusual uh, coincidence that we are neighbors, the Ministry of Culture and Media is a neighbor with the Health Center Zagreb, uh, one of the co-organizers and co-hosts of this conference. And with the director of the Zagreb Health Center Zagreb, Antonia Belenovic, I've had a number of exchanges and ideas prior to this pandemic on how to connect uh, what they are doing at the health centers are, and what we are doing at the Ministry of Culture and Media. And from those uh, discussions, I guess the idea came up that we talk also today about uh, linkages between the promotion of health, which is what you do, and the promotion of culture and interaction of the two. I'm grateful that you found a slot in this conference for someone to talk about culture because we live in the times when it is really difficult to get attention to any topic uh, beyond health, protection of health or economy, the saving of economy. And uh, I must say, even in Croatian government, uh, those two topics uh, dominate our discussions in the past few months, but we nevertheless found strength to uh, address also uh, the needs of other sectors and to understand uh, that we can't underestimate the role of other fields of life and other sectors uh, in this crisis as a potential contribution both uh, to well-being and to maintaining and, 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 and to health as well as to the reflection of what these other sectors can contribute in these difficult economic times. For Croatian government, and I'm sure that the other speakers will be able and will probably speak about that as well, uh, we reacted very quickly uh, to the pandemic and in the first few uh, weeks or months, we were able to have uh, to control it rather well and we were quite effective and efficient in, uh, in uh, preventing uh, a more damaging growth of the, of the number of uh, infected people. However, in the past few months, few weeks, the same as in some other European countries, we have again a, a worrisome uh, situation and the numbers that are growing and we are all making a lot of effort to uh, maintain and control the pandemic. In these circumstances, however, we did not opt uh, for radical lockdowns other than uh, the first few weeks. And during the, and this brings me to one of the first topics that I would like to address, and that was the role of arts and culture uh, in the immediate situation of a global, almost global uh, lockdown or a subsequent lockdown as the countries were uh, introducing it. Uh, we witnessed um, how important it was for people who were uh, uh, in their apartments, in their houses, whose ability 
uh, to move, to walk outside, to interact with other people was reduced, how important it was uh, to participate in different online uh, culture and artistic activities. We were watching uh, movies online, we were participating in different workshops, we were uh, reading books, and uh, they were attending operas and, and theatres, and everything somehow moved in this online world. And uh, it was in, in, in my, I, I really believe that this was very important uh, for our citizens uh, across the world, uh, for their, first of all, for their psychological uh, well-being, but also uh, to maintain the spirit and to be able to fulfill the long days uh, uh, in the quarantine with, with uh, cultural content that in normal circumstances and in normal life they would intend themselves in theatres, cinemas, in other cultural spaces. Um, I would like to uh, mention here that for us in Croatia, but also uh, in many other countries, uh, the effect of the pandemic on the cultural sector created a huge problem, particularly for freelance artists uh, who um, depend on their monthly incomes and that are all linked together and gathering a larger number of audiences. And this is when we think about future, one of the main challenges that as governments, as ministers of culture across the world, we are facing at the moment uh, trying to uh, come up with alternative ways of production and distribution of culture, not only in order to uh, preserve a certain level of cultural life and activities for our audiences, but also to enable artists to continue to live from their, um, from their work. Uh, the second topic, and in fact, this is the topic which uh, uh, brought me originally uh, to be one of the speakers of your conference uh, once or at that time when it was conceived prior to this pandemic was a question of culture and heritage and participation of culture in culture and heritage activities um, in the context of, of well-being. Um, your conference uh, instead of online, was supposed to be held in Šibenik in April, a city that has uh, two sites inscribed on UNESCO World Heritage List, the Cathedral of St. Jacob and the Fortress of St. Nicholas. Um, I sincerely hope that uh, once this crisis is over, regardless of the plans of the organizers of the conference, uh, some of you will take uh, the time and will visit uh, this extraordinary city, but also visit other uh, Croatian sites uh, uh, and cultural heritage uh, sites that are uh, inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Croatia has uh, 10 uh, sites that are inscribed in the World Heritage List. Probably the best known are the uh, historic city of Dubrovnik and the uh, Plitice Lake as a national park, but also uh, uh, the historic core of Split and the Diocletian Palace. And uh, we have also a number of other sites inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List which is the cathedral in Poreć, the historic city of Trogir. I mentioned uh, the cathedral in Šibenik, as well as the complex of fortresses, of Venetian fortresses, as the sites as a, as a site inscribed in Croatia and in neighboring countries. In Croatia, uh, we inscribed the fortresses of Šibenik and Zadar, but also, uh, the, also Agar, the oldest Greek uh, cadastral plain in Mediterranean pr preserved, as well as uh, as the woods at the Velvet Mountain. Um, especially when we talk about nature and um, and um, 
parks and national parks, uh, we can establish a direct link between the value of the preservation of nature and the protection of health and well-being. Uh, once again, at this uh, difficult time of the pandemic, where we are trying to reduce uh, the number of people that are gathering and meeting, uh, especially in uh, inside, uh, we are encouraging our citizens, uh, of course, while respecting all the rules and regulations, to be to visit as much as possible, to spend as much time as possible. Um, uh, in outside, in nature, and in this context, uh, the preservation of nature and the protection of nature, especially through national parks, is very important. I started this uh, intervention by saying that at the moment, globally, we have uh, uh, this crisis, which is particularly uh, affecting the health, of course, because it is a health crisis, but which provoked also the deepest economic crisis that we have experienced, most probably in the past uh, 100 years. In this context, we are looking at the potential, once the pandemic is under control, the potential of culture and cultural tourism uh, as one of the vehicles for the restoration of economic activities and for, uh, in, that, in that context, as a source of income uh, for local economies. And this is probably one of the linkages uh, uh, that also needs to be uh, kept in mind. We have seen uh, a major devastating effect on the economy of culture across the world. As I said at the beginning of this intervention, uh, this refers to the fact that majority of culture uh, 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 events require a larger number of people in a particular period of time at one space, which is at this, which represents a great danger in this particular moment. So, in that context, I I also urge all of you that take part in the reflection of the public health to assist us in finding solutions. Uh, to uh, create favorable and safe circumstances in these uh, times for the visits to the museums, libraries. We see that everything is reopening so that uh, the, the basic cultural life as such is preserved uh, for the time after the pandemic when we all hope that it will start growing again. Uh, as I have a limited uh, limited amount of time, I would like to point, uh, and if you were in Shivanik uh, yourself, uh, you would have probably experienced at least some of these two phenomena that I would like to mention. Um, and, and, and I would like to mention a few uh, Croatian uh, sites. Uh, which are part of our UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which are uh, very relevant for the times that, uh, that we are living in. Uh, probably the first one that I would like to mention is the long tradition of uh, pharmacies, public pharmacies. In fact, it was first, they were set up mostly as monastery uh, pharmacies in Croatia. The oldest one in Dubrovnik, in the Franciscan monastery, dating back in 1317. We have celebrated 700 years of the continuous work of this pharmacy in the same spot uh, three years ago. So this is one of the tradition. Uh, once, when it was established, it was established in order to protect uh, uh, the citizens, the lives of citizens. Uh, from different illnesses. Today, it represents a rich reservoir of our cultural heritage with the artifacts that are preserved, with the recipes that are preserved, with the practices that we cherish as cultural heritage. The other side that I would like to mention again, uh, uh, located in Dubrovnik, is Lazareti. It is one of the oldest system of quarantines uh, in Europe, established also as early as 
13th, 14th century, but then built as a complex of buildings just outside the old uh, city of Dubrovnik, which have been recently restored and today represents one of the uh, very interesting cultural venues in the as part of the historic uh, center of the Brahmic uh, preserved at the UNESCO World Heritage List. When we talk about well-being and culture, I can't uh, skip or I, I shouldn't forget to mention also one phenomenon that is described on the UNESCO World Heritage Intangible uh, List or uh, Registry of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, and that is the Mediterranean diet. Uh, something that is a heritage belonging to several Mediterranean countries uh, and that developed through centuries uh, connecting culture and food. But uh, today, Mediterranean diet is probably the best known as the one, uh, probably the most favorable diet uh, in contemporary world for our citizens when it comes to health and well-being. So once again, something that was developed from the knowledge, skills, sometimes the vision of our ancestors and became part of our history is, uh, um, is today uh, a part of our rich world heritage, which we are cherishing and maintaining. I sincerely hope that, of course, just as every single individual citizen of this world, that we will primarily, uh, with the help of dedicated uh, medical uh, staff, but also researchers and scientists, that we will find a way to deal with this pandemic and with this crisis as soon as we see the end of it or we see a way to control it and maintain it under control, uh, we will see a need uh, for the other sectors uh, to get in the spotlight again and to look for uh, their uh, continuation uh, following new normal in a regular normal circumstances. And I sincerely hope that at that time, we might have the opportunity again to talk about the linkages between culture and well-being, the cultural heritage and health, and reflect um, those about those issues in uh, hopefully fundamentally different circumstances. Until then, uh, I would like to wish you uh, much success in your online deliberation. I would like once again, and discussions, I would like once again uh, to stress how sad I am that you were not able to um, visit Shivanik, visit Croatia, hopefully other sites of our rich uh, cultural heritage. But I hope that when the circumstances change, uh, some of you might decide to visit that spot that you were uh, supposed to visit in this unfortunate 2020. Once again, uh, thank, I would like to thank the organizer for this invitation and wish you all the best uh, during the conference. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, welcome greetings and speeches from Croatia. And now it is my great honor and the pleasure to announce Anya Carroll. She is a professor of healthcare integration and improvement of uh, University College Dublin, co-director of National Rehabilitation Hospital, and also board member of uh, International Foundation of for Integrated Care. Anya. Thank you very much, Antonia. So Tafalcha Rota Karja, Gobalia Clear Majin. Welcome, friends and colleagues, to a sunny Dublin. It is a very great pleasure to be here this morning on behalf of my colleagues on the IFIC board to co-chair the first plenary session. There is no doubt that we live in very strange times. But as I was reflecting last night and really looking forward to today, my greatest feeling wasn't of fear or trepidation or concern, but actually of gratitude. I am very grateful to be here today with you about to embark on an adventure, the IC-IC20 conference. 
And although we are apart, I feel a great sense of connection across the globe as we connect through our shared passion for integrated care. This is our family here together. And as Irish philosopher John O'Donoghue said, inspiration is always a surprising visitor. So let's invite inspiration in. Please send in your questions and get involved because this is your conference and it's really important that we hear from you and that we connect and share our passion for integrated care. So we have all shared this experience of COVID and now we would like to share with you a video montage, COVID, the voice of lived experience. Worldwide, everybody is quite, you know, united because we are all facing a common enemy now, which is the coronavirus. Yeah, that was a kind of experience. Uh, how do you, in such a situation, take your responsibility or uh, as a knowledge institute on a national level? So that was for me personal, of course, because I'm the CEO of the organization, a, a, an important challenge. And how do you do that? How do you do it together with your stakeholders? Uh, besides, how do you care for your staff? Uh, and how is your staff doing? Um, can they manage working at home? And for myself, uh, I also have three kids. So uh, how am I going to manage that? Because I have, um, uh, I would say babysitter, but my children, it's, it's a little bit weird because they're not babies anymore. <laughs> but my, uh, you could say nanny or something, uh, she's uh, 71. So um, uh, she's uh, very healthy, but she was in a risk uh, situation. So we said, well, it's maybe not responsible anymore that you come to our home to babysit on the children. But um, well, in the situation I just explained, having having three kids by my own, I had a new challenge how to run uh, also the home situation with the children at home. So that was also a personal um, challenge, you could say, yeah. The uh, Chief Medical Officer of Scotland sent a letter out to all the uh, people that were supposed to be of high risk in Scotland uh, from COVID-19, but that uh, letter missed thousands of people, including my wife. That letter was supposed to give us easy access to uh, home deliveries and to medication. So. It meant a lot of running around, well, not running around, but uh, uh, a lot of phoning around, uh, trying to get uh, Pam onto the list of those at high risk, which she was, of course, uh, because she's going through leukemia and uh, through chemotherapy at the time. So it was confusing, it was frustrating. Uh, there was supposed to be planning done a few years ago about this, but it doesn't seem to have uh, trickled through. It didn't work very well. This virus has stopped a lot of our daily life routine and all. We're unable to travel and all. So I don't know. I feel in a way, no matter no matter which country we are from, we are all facing the same problem. We, have, we know we have experienced lockdowns, you know, and grappling with this pandemic, and how how for most part of 2020, our life has kind of been on on hold and on slow motion. Yeah, so I feel in that way we can sort of resonate with each other, no matter where we are. Going around care homes um, and seeing all these really kind of like elderly people, especially people who have like quite onset dementia, because they can't understand what's going on. They've got no concept of COVID. And then there's strange people in their room trying to go in their throat and um, they can't have visitors or anything. So I think that's probably the most heartbreaking thing I've seen so far effect that it's had on myself is that I can say that that from from day to day in regular routine practice there's I, I can't even emphasize enough how disturbing it is for me to face a patient when I'm donning a mask and the patient has a mask because um, I try and humor my patients and I <clears throat> excuse me I, I use a sense of humor and sometimes if I said something sarcastic and the patient doesn't see my face so you don't know, and you don't see their face, you don't know if they're accepting it. A, a lot of uh, the, the, the rapport that you develop with a patient face-to-face -face is, is through face expression. And even for the patient to be uh, receptive towards your, your condolences or your empathy or sympathy with, without the, the facial expressions, I think is such a, a, 
it's a profound hindrance to the regular contact. I mean, the, imagine if I had to speak to you right now with a mask on, <laughs> how disturbing that would be. And and I, I had a patient, one of the patients came in with a hearing problem. And it was so difficult to relay the regular uh, consultation that we can do because he could see, he could read my lips. Um, so I could say, I mean, I mean, it's it's one of the the, the small uh, prices to pay, but in general, it's very very disturbing. I think that it can teach us that uh, how important it is in in general um, to recruit all the uh, faculties that we have to relay our messages and to show that we're listening and and just to allow for the empathy to to uh, take place uh, during the confrontation as much as possible. Yeah, what affected me most was that my father he was also. Um, uh, ill and uh, he was tested also and he was 71 years old but he's very healthy sportive person and he was also tested positive for the coronavirus and uh, he became more uh, thick every day and uh, after four days uh, he had to go to the hospital and there he uh, stayed in isolation for four days but uh, I wanted to visit him and my mother also, but we were not allowed to because I was still quarantined and my mother also. So my sister, she uh, could visit him um, once a day, but after four, four days, his situation worsened and they called my mother and they asked us to come to the hospital. And there we had about 10 minutes, I think, to, to say a sort of goodbye to him and to uh, wish him the best for his stay at intensive care. So now when you look at um, the healthcare infrastructure without access for older persons and then you look at the social protection infrastructure and then of course you also know that um, older persons are disproportionately affected by non-communicable diseases. So you have that situation and then here comes COVID-19. I just laid that foundation for you to know that now with COVID-19 and the fact that disproportionately really had a toll on older persons. So you could see that we came from a disadvantage, infrastructure-wise. Older persons came from a disadvantage. So what we looked for in the foundation and in SG Africa, we constantly were looking to identify the mechanisms uh, whereby older persons could effectively be included in the policy responses, policy responses for COVID-19. And of course, you know that COVID-19 <laughs> turned out is not only a health pandemic, it is social, it is economic, and then psychosocial. So older persons were really seriously, seriously affected by the um, containment and mitigation um, strategies adopted by our government in Nigeria and of course across Africa. Thank you. Heart people with, or living in poverty or, or on very low incomes much, much harder than anybody else. I mean, we were finding it difficult at the start, but I know from the contacts that I've had that people in poverty or on low incomes were really struggling. They didn't uh, allow home visits and all, so I couldn't, you know, couldn't at all meet anybody outside of my family. Yeah, so that was like for two whole months. And two, two months actually seems, it sounds short, but when you go day by day and you're just going from work, home, work, home, then that, during that period, it felt like ages, you know. Yeah, just to even see someone outside of work. But um, looking back now, I feel, I don't know, because I, I was uh, apart with, from my boyfriend for a little, for that period. So I don't know, absence does make the heart grow fonder, I guess. <laughs> so in that uh, in that in that sense, yeah, it's about human relationships, you know. Yeah, these yeah. kind of things were all put on hold. What happened was all the services for the NHS locally closed down, apart from absolute uh, life or death emergencies. Everything everything closed down. The problem being that uh, the right to health is 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 not an absolute right. It's a it's a qualified or limited right. And uh, in states of emergency, uh, public bodies can, well, ignore it. And, and, they, and they, were, they did, they closed down all the services. It, a, right to, a right to health doesn't give you a right to be healthy. 
And what they did in the north of Holland, they made a sort of diary uh, for my father. So every day they, they wrote some things uh, about him. And um, when he was moved to the north, we also uh, sent some pictures of himself and his family so that they uh, should know who he, he was because they couldn't speak with him and we were far away so that he were not he was not just just one of a number but uh, that he was uh, that they knew who he was so they wanted to try to uh, wake him but uh, they could not wake him he did not wake up and then they found out that um, uh, he had a sort of a cerebral infarction and that was very bad because they they found us and we knew that was the end because it wasn't able to to live with with all that uh, with this complication um, we have to adapt every day um, and we are used to the situation partly uh, but partly it's still another situation than would be ideal ideal or perfect so uh, we keep on uh, adapting our work uh, but also think about um, yeah how do we proceed in the future and what does it mean for uh, new challenges yeah we are not looking at things from the lens of COVID. COVID-19 magnified so many things that we had been advocating for so long and people did not see it so somehow there's a silver lining because now um, you can point to COVID-19 the toll the, the rate of mortality amongst the you know geriatric population uh, their lack of access to healthcare when it came to their non-communicable diseased conditions and then the social protection aspect of it. So it's very easy now to advocate um, with the evidence that we have. So yes, COVID-19 gave us a lens to magnify the inequalities, the abuse and all the discrimination, the ageism that we have been talking about, yes. Community is a lot closer together. I'm, I'm hoping that this closeness uh, continues after we see the back of COVID-19, if we do see the back of COVID-19, that this, the same uh, camaraderie, the same uh, willingness to help others uh, carries on afterwards. I hear, for instance, over the net, uh, um, what's happening in, in New York and South America. I mean, it's it's really heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking to, to, to see people lonely and, and undertaking the most uh, precious uh, and and crucial moments uh, without family members. I I, I mean I, I can I can just cry now to think of the, the how upsetting and, and disturbing it is to undergo such such di difficulty. But we pray for everybody that, that will come through this uh, best as possible and, and pay the, the, the lowest price possible that we can go back to our normal lives, hopefully. Yeah, and stay healthy. <laughs> stay safe. Look after each other. And wash your hands. <laughs>
extreme expertise in the whole area of public health to speak to us today on our plenary session. And Natasha is going to speak to us today about a partnership approach to increasing regional impact in improving health and care outcomes during and beyond COVID-19. You're very welcome, Natasha. Thank you, Anya. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And it's really my pleasure to be here with you all um, this morning. And uh, as uh, now I have been assigned responsibility for the division of country health policies and systems, which is a new division that has been set up within WHO Euro following the election of the regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, I thought that it would be um, uh, interesting if I were to share with you some of the work that doing in the area of integrated care during the past months, as well as um, our vision and roadmap going forward, which we hope will be adopted um, next week at the regional committee. And uh, um, the reason is that the, the motto that we have adopted is United Action for Better Health. And this, of course, means that we would like to work very closely with organizations such as EFIC and I hope that in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will give an overview of the kind of um, work that we intend to do and the opportunities that there could be for us to work with you going forward. So without further ado, I will uh, proceed to share my screen. And I hope that you are all seeing my screen now. So basically, until recently, as you know, the WHO European region covers 53 member states and all of us are to some extent in the business of keeping people healthy and providing care and support for them when they become ill. And this slide just shows us the wide diversity of the types of people that we care for, keeping in mind, however, that the European region is actually the continent where we have the highest proportion of elderly persons who often need um, an appreciable amount of support and care. And moving to our couple here, Malcolm and Barbara, typical of many um, elderly persons who may still be um, living in the community, fortunate in that they still have each other whilst there are so many who are absolutely isolated and alone in their final years of life. And this is what a typical web of care would look like. Many professionals involved in supporting them on a daily basis. And then what happened in February, COVID struck. We didn't know much about it. There was a knee jerk reaction, which was to a certain extent fueled by the precautionary principle of trying to keep as many people as safe as possible and trying to avoid deaths. And one of the outcomes was that a number of um, our health workers were repurposed or reprofiled to deal with the COVID pandemic. But more so, there was this perception that health workers themselves may um, transmit disease or illness to visiting elderly. Um, uh, persons. And so there was this uh, decision in many countries to halt the services which were seen as not being urgent. Everybody at the time, I think, was hoping that this would be a matter perhaps of a few weeks. And therefore, in the spirit of trying to protect those who are most vulnerable, um, stopped a lot of visiting services, for example, and domiciliary services with the result that people like Malcolm and Barbara ended up often very much isolated and alone, perhaps having their GP or district nurse at the end of a telephone. As WHO, together with our partners here at the observatory, will be meeting um, Giuseppe Figueres on the panel later on, we were immediately quite concerned about all these um, decisions and interventions that were being taken by countries without any coordination. Everybody was grappling to try to find the best solution. 
and we set up the COVID-19 health systems response monitor to chronicle what was taking place and provide some sense of perhaps some of the interventions that were being carried out that seemed more promising. So in order to also provide a point of reference for countries who are trying to understand how to navigate through this period, keeping in mind also that there were certain countries who were affected earlier than others and others therefore who were affected later on had this very small window of opportunity to learn from those who, who were further ahead of the curve. And this is a monitor that we are still um, updating and the latest um, innovation that we will put in place in the coming weeks is actually to concentrate, for example, on schools and the interventions that are being put in place for safe uh, schooling. One of the things that became immediately apparent is that there were severe service disruptions due to COVID-19, as I explained earlier. And the World Health Organization actually conducted a survey. And as you can see um, over here, many services that form the backbone of chronic care, um, which are so necessary for the integrated care service approach, were partially or severely disrupted. And I would like, for example, to highlight over here, rehabilitation services, non-communicable disease diagnostic and treatment services, routine immunization services. And again, um, here children and the elderly could be the ones who are most adversely affected. And also allow me to dwell um, briefly on mental health. Um, many mental health services were also partially disrupted. And of course, um, this is not good news because as we are heading into autumn and winter and we expect um, COVID to be peaking again, can we afford to cont continue this amount of service disruption indefinitely, having pent up demand, having perhaps excess mortality, which is due not to COVID itself, but due to the fact that services are either not provided or as people themselves are holding back from seeking them. Another element um, that I would like to dwell on briefly is about long-term care. One of the things that I like to say about COVID is that COVID has unmasked the cracks that most of us professionals knew were there had been advocating, whether it was about the impact of austerity policies and the lack of investment in public health services. This is something that as advocates for health systems, we have been talking about for the last five to seven years. But what COVID has done is to really unmask these in a very glaring and obvious ways. And one of the sectors that has been um, really um, uh, uh, affected and has become far more visible, has come out of the shadows in terms of the gaps and deficiencies, is long-term care. The governance, we know, is very difficult. But what has happened is that in the sector, the mix of public, private for profit um, uh, and, uh, and private providers has often led to a poor oversight of what is actually taking place. What we saw also is that the sector had no reserve fronts on which to draw on, and there was a delay in placing infection and prevention control measures in place. Gross inequalities, depending on where you were, in which institution you were, and which part of the region. And then I think this was the biggest issue, which again, those of us in academia working in the sector were very acutely aware of, but this has now become public knowledge. The fact that this sector relies predominantly on women, on migrants with relatively poor working conditions who are left um, completely isolated and alone to deal with a huge crisis with mental health implications also for themselves. With family caregivers having had to step in where long-term care institutions were not able, for example, to continue caring, anecdotal stories of somebody on dialysis in a long-term care institution whose daughter was told um, you have to take your mother out if you want to ensure that she continues to receive her dialysis because otherwise we can't guarantee that she can be cared for safely here and won't pose a risk to other residents with the ripple effects on the daughter, her work, her employment and everything. And then also 
um, people with long-term care needs in institutions, in the community, have been the ones who have suffered most by the service disruptions. Where are we at the moment? Moving towards primary care, for example. At the moment, we are heading for a very tough autumn and winter where we have the dual burden of COVID and non-COVID management. And we are working at the moment, in fact, on a, on a policy document to try to help member states as they grapple with the safest and most effective way and try to find the balance between safety on the one hand, but also ensuring that we don't go through prolonged service disruptions on the other hand. And as though primary care doesn't have enough on its plate, increasingly we know that now we are having patients with what we call long COVID. And primary care has often not been um, involved enough in the care of COVID patients in the initial part of the pandemic where it was more hospital focused. And now we expect them to pick up the pieces and to also deal with long COVID. And this is another piece of work that we are carrying out in the coming weeks to try to provide guidance and support. So I think this is how a number of people are feeling. This is how a number of healthcare providers are feeling. This person feeling that, that he's standing alone in the middle of the raging storm could be an elderly person, could be a nurse on her own heading a long-term institution, could, could be a GP in a rural community. Looking forward, having hope. Um, uh, when uh, our regional director prior to his election carried out a tour of the 53 countries to inspire his vision for um, a new program of work for the European region. And we started working on it, leaving no one behind, strengthening leadership of health authorities, and working also on the tri triple billion goals of universal health coverage, protecting against health emergencies, and promoting health and well being. And I was working on this document together with a few others already way back last November. And suddenly COVID struck. What did this mean for the European program of work? it just heightened the relevance of everything that we had been told should be priorities. That was the impact. So basically, we know more than ever that citizens now have expectations on their health authorities. They expect that they have access to good quality care because COVID has placed such a lens on health and long-term care services. In November, when we were writing the document, we had the feeling that the, in the European region, health emergencies may be less important than in other regions, like Africa, where Ebola was still raging. Of course, COVID has totally drawn a fresh page for us in this perspective. And finally, citizens expect to be healthy and well. And what lessons can we learn about improving our schools, our living environments, our commute? In terms of primary care, we are working on a new approach and a new strategy that is very much taking into account the lessons that we learned from COVID across these pillars, but seeing how we can move them forward. So we're talking about infrastructure renewal, about the workforce competencies, about how we can um, improve our organizational models such that primary care can link better with mental health, with long-term care. And I think that COVID has provided a real opportunity to learn the lessons and move forward. And finally, we had identified four flagship areas. Remember that these had been identified practically a year ago, but they just become so much more relevant. We need to focus on mental health, to build a coalition for mental health, mental health for the vulnerable, for the people who are left behind, but also for our health workforce. Digital health and innovation. Time is short, so I can't go into detail here, but we know that within the space of weeks, the innovations that we have seen in digital health and health systems were those that we had been trying to bring about for decades. And suddenly regulatory barriers fell, suddenly people became more amenable. Of course, there are lessons to be learned, but I think there is no going back. When we used to talk about going from the waiting room to the living room, it has happened. And how do we sustain this going forward? The third area is immunization. Of course, this is big on the agenda in the next few weeks and months as we try to ensure that people take their influenza vaccine 
And also, as we navigate carefully and cautiously, but at speed, the deployment of a safe COVID vaccine. But this is, of course, resisted by some groups in society and we need to build trust. And finally, and I think this is a really important area for future research also for the integrated care community, it's about leveraging behavioral and cultural insights for health, making people partners and listening to them and understanding how they want us to configure our services. And that is the fourth flagship. As I said, we need to do this together with people. The World Health Organization on its own is actually a very small organization as I realized upon recently joining. And we, what we can do is use our convening um, ability and power to unleash the great critical mass through our partnerships. We're working very much to try to support countries and working also to restructure our regional office to be able to do so. And finally, looking ahead, and I included this slide, not so that you can have a look at all the, all the pictures from the first meeting, but highlighted in red, um, last, uh, well, two weeks ago, I think it was now already, we launched the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable De Development. This is an independent commission that will advise the regional director, Hans Klug, it is chaired by Professor Mario Monti, about our trajectory going forward um, in order to learn lessons from the COVID pandemic and build strongest health and, and health systems for society. And I highlighted in red that one of the four key bullet points is very much about further integration between health and social care systems. So I am sure there's going to be plenty and scope um, of opportunity for us to continue working together. And I very much look forward to doing this in the coming weeks and months. Thank you for giving Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, uh, it, it, for an excellent uh, talk and also congratulations on your new role and the new division. I think that it is a very timely development on the part of um, the WHO. So I wish you every success in your new role. Um, just to pick up on uh, some of the areas that you covered, um, as I said in my introduction, I think that there's a real recognition um, now, perhaps more than any other time, that public health has a huge role uh, to play in the management of the pandemic. But for example, in Ireland, public health colleagues are still awaiting consultant status which is a huge problem. It shows that there is a um, lack of recognition of um, my colleagues' specialty. Uh, and there are plans to change that. But it makes me want to ask the question, how do we value public health? Do we, do we value it enough globally? Thank you, Anya. Um, well, the straight and short answer from somebody who has dedicated two decades of my life to, to public health advocacy is no, it's not valued enough, um, of course. But I think it's very easy to blame others for not understanding what we do. And with my colleagues, um, my, my take was always about how can we understand where we need to be at the right moment, at the right time and be visible. And this requires us very much to be um, walking the bridge all the time between our clinical colleagues on the front line, in the hospitals, in primary care, and on the other hand, talking to ministers for education, transport, environment. And sometimes the difficulty is that we tend to veer too much in one direction and forget about an, um, the other constituency. So, in fact, um, allow me to make a small plug for a webinar that we are um, uh, hosting with the Association for Public Health Schools in the European region next Friday. We've just launched a report on the new skills and competencies that the public health workforce need to have. I think it's already more or less probably outdated because of COVID and all that COVID has taught us. But basically, there is really an opportunity because there is the lens on public health for the public health profession to also think long and hard about what we need to be doing to be where we need to be at the right moment, at the right place, 
supporting our clinical colleagues, working hand in hand with them, but also having the leadership and moral authority to be able to stand up to the political um, uh, powers that be and speak with the voice of science and communicate clearly to engage the public. It's not an easy one, but that's where we should aim to be. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I agree about the need to, uh, for engagement between um, clinical colleagues uh, and indeed uh, colleagues across the whole uh, continuum of care. Um, again, in my introduction, I give a shout out to public health, but also I feel I need to do the same for primary care. Uh, and your presentation, I was delighted to see that uh, one of your uh, pillars uh, is, is around primary care. But I find myself thinking this isn't the first time that uh, that the WHO have um, really pushed the importance of primary and community care. So I was wondering uh, what's going to be different about this report? Um, how can we really see the changes that we need to see in primary care? Thank you, Anya. Primary care is not an easy area to work with because with hospitals, although there may be nuances, it's typically quite a standard approach that you get. Primary care is very much um, where it is, what it is, because of historical, cultural and contextual factors. And any kind of approach that tries to impose a uniform, harmonised um, uh, uh, approach to primary care can't work. So I think what we would like to try and do is, first and foremost, you can't push primary care down people's throats. People, want, need, people need to want to go to primary care. So primary care needs to be the natural um, harbour for patients and for, for, for citizens. Once primary care starts to become more and more the natural harbour for patients and citizens, the advocacy to improve the services in primary care, to make sure that they are appropriately um, resourced and staffed, will follow. And I think what we need to think hard about is whilst we might be inspired by the Almaty Astana declarations of the past, we need to bring primary care very much into the 21st century rather than hankering nostalgically backwards at what was or what could have been. And the primary care that we need in the 21st century will need to necessarily um, be a, a combination of the virtual and the digital together with the human needs to be a combination very much of reaching out and bringing in the specialist support workforce behind us because we need to ensure that primary care is just as accessible or more accessible than secondary care services. It doesn't make sense for somebody to be able to get into secondary care within 24 hours and have to wait five days for an appointment in primary care. And there also needs to be the trust and the credibility. It's not going to be an easy one, but I think that if we are able to think a little bit more openly and not institute barriers ourselves between what we think is primary care, community care, social care, mental health, um, specialist and military services, and different countries may also have different formulas. I think we all know what we want. We want care that is as far away from the hospital and the institution as possible because that can harm particularly more than help the elderly and vulnerable people. We want care that is available to a multidisciplinary team. We want it to be accessible as close to persons as possible um, in a convenient way to them and also um, in a way that, that um, response to their to their needs and concerns. We can't forget, however, in all of this the workforce. Within a hospital, you are very much part of a larger institution. You have support easily. In the primary care, in the domiciliary setting, we have a lot of frontline silent heroes who are very much dealing with difficult situations, often in professional isolation of very small teams. And so I think that key to achieving any changes must be to work with and through our primary care stakeholders in the workforce. Thank you very much, Natasha. And uh, a final uh, question. 
as a rehabilitation medicine physician, I was very shocked, but not surprised by your data on rehabilitation and long-term care. And we know there is plenty of evidence to show that these cohorts are best served by person-centered coordinated care. So why is it so difficult to take a longer term view in a political world with a very short attention span? That has always been a very difficult one um, because particularly, as I say, um, the longevity of governments and ministers of health becomes shorter Anything that is seen as something that will only deliver results in the long term is not palatable and, and attractive. However, my experience has taught me that there are always windows of opportunity and that sometimes something for a very short while rises to the top of the political agenda. And perhaps this is the moment for a lot of those sectors that have been in the shadows for so long. And um, when there is this opportunity, we need to go out and seize it. It's always going to be the case that some, some areas somehow are more attractive in terms of funding, in terms of raising donations, inspiring um, uh, the public. But I think ask anyone, for example, who has had to have a hip replacement, who the most important person in that journey was. And most people will fail to mention the orthopedic surgeon who may have done a splendid job but will remember the name and face of the physiotherapist who got them to walk again. Exactly. Uh, and it's um, really important to give a big shout out to our health and social care, um, health and social care professional colleagues, um, many of whom um, are joining us today as um, delegates. So um, Natasha, on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of the organizing committee and the delegates who have had the, the pleasure of listening to your presentation today, um, I thank you very much and give you a virtual round of applause. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank so, you. Thank um, you. Antonia, um, I'm going to hand back to you to introduce the panel, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. It is my great honor and a pleasure to present our panelists. Uh, first, uh, Joseph Figueras, he's the director of European Observatory on Health System and Policies. The second, Donald McCaskill, he is the CEO of Scottish Care, which represents the largest group of independent sector social care providers across Scotland. Mark Tober. He is a, clin a clinical director and consultant uh, physician and honorary senior lecturer in palliative medicine and HS Trust. Dr. Claire Thomas, she is immediate past president of Vasco de Gama for European Young Doctors World Organization of Family Doctors. And last but not least, uh, representative from Croatia, Dr. Tanya Choric, she represents the reference center for Health Protection of Elderly of Ministry of Health for Croatia and also Public Health Institute on the Ashtampa School, Zagreb. Uh, so I would like just from all of you to have a brief response on the video you have just seen or on the COVID experience around you. So please, uh, Joseph. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you. Real pleasure to be here with so many friends and esteemed colleagues. Uh, I would say the video would be of, of large viewing, particularly for our policymakers, because we sort of tend to forget those realities, even if we read so much about. I thought it was really useful to see some of the statistics, the evidence so well presented by Natasha and see those realities at the front line, both for the patients as well as the um, human resources. I don't want to fall into stereotype because we all fall into that one, but I will anyway, I suppose. It's just the resilience. Uh, uh, we've been amazed. Uh, I suppose if there is a um, silver lining, and I am very hesitating talking about silver linings after the pain of COVID or with the pain of COVID, there is this community resilience that actually Emmanuel Mokoro mentioned uh, very well, this solidarity, this resourcefulness that we found in our communities in our patients and certainly uh, we saw as well the ingenuity, the commitment of the professionals. But also let me remind you that the applauses at eight o'clock every evening are over. 
some of our personnel are really burned out and we need to more than ever put in place the support mechanisms. In the observatory with the WHO, this website, the monitoring website, we've been looking at some of the best practices on supporting our staff in that area. And the second perhaps lesson that we learned there, and again, tallies it beautifully with the point that Natasha made earlier, is that, is it really surprising what has happened? What has happened basically has magnified, it has uncovered the cracks, as Natasha said nicely, and one of the presenters in the video said, the real weaknesses of our health systems. Who's surprised here that between 30 and 70% of the mortality was in nursing homes? How long we've been talking about the governance, about the regulation, about the quality, about the lack of support of that staff, that many of those did not have even good medical services at hand. Uh, again, we had one of the analysis in our website, it's been on the mortality in nursing homes and seeing where have been the issues. But more than that, this is not what has happened, it's what's coming now. Are we ready now with these nursing homes? In the same way, and I'll, I'll wrap it up here, uh, we heard that the Malcolm and Barber example has been used, and, and Natasha has put it very effectively, that now on top of lack of coordination, there are no actual services. We heard that now at the moment, but it's such surprising. Every single crisis we've been studying, the observatory has been studying with WHO, the crisis, financial crisis, we look at the migratory crisis and the refugee crisis. The examples are the same. Universal coverage, access, the vulnerable population being the ones that have been affected the most. So there are surprises, but very little surprises. There are bigger lessons. I hope this time we'll learn them. And these presenters in the video have beautifully, nicely reminded us of these realities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. We'll come back to you with the questions. And now just brief response from Donald. Donald. Thank you. And thanks to the committee and organising committee for inviting me to come. Uh, I thought the video was also very beautiful. And Ina, in her opening remarks, mentioned the Irish philosopher and poet John O'Donoghue. And John O'Donoghue, in one of his poems, speaks about grief feeling like the ground beneath you becoming fragile. And, and that has been the experience of so many working in the front line in social care. As Joseph says, we have long known the problems and the challenges, the weaknesses and the fault lines. But the pandemic has made the ground in which we stand all the more fragile and unstable. And the video beautifully expresses the sense of raw grief and hurt which people have felt both in health and in social care, in the community and in wider society. But I think the video and the contributions, certainly in the speech from Natasha, also point our way forward so that we can find stability and we can move forward together. And critically for those of us who work in social care, that moving forward, that stability, has to be in the integration of health and social care services. We can no longer see social care as the Cinderella service, as the afterthought, as the sector that we give what is left from the cake of resource. If we are to protect the most vulnerable, if we are to reduce the blatant age discrimination in our health and social care systems, then we can only do that by working together. And in the words of Alec Forburn from Scotland in the video, we can only do that if we embed our approach in a human rights based model. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, on your great overview of the social care system. Probably it's similar all over the world, maybe Cinderella syndrome. And now I would like to hear also a brief response from Mark. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the videos. I'm, I'm a palliative care doctor. Um, I'm a lead in Wales for advanced care planning as well, which um, really changed considerably during COVID-19. And I think um, a lot of the things that were said in the video and in Natasha's presentation also struck home uh, with me and, and were quite significant. 
Um, thanks, Natasha, for mentioning palliative care in your presentation as well. It is sometimes an area which 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 can be overlooked, um, and we've had previous discussions that sometimes public health and primary care can be over overlooked. So, I, I would come in on, on this area as well. But this was as much a, a pandemic as it was a palliative pandemic, or still is a palliative pandemic. Um, I'm a palliative care doctor. The tools of my trade are my voice, my face, my my communication, and a lot of this was very much impeded by the face masks that we had to use. I work in a cancer center, I work in a hospital, and I work in a hospice as well. And you can imagine how difficult this, this, this was and how difficult the decisions sometimes were. Um, making decisions and asking people to perhaps go to the hospice when their symptoms were bad, when they knew that that could mean that they would not see their family again, uh, was one of the hardest things we've, we've, we've had to do. And, and it really strikes home that this was such an, an, a coordinated response where we all just trying to creatively do as much as we possibly could. I think there's some good things that came out of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that, that I'm here today because I see all these, um, these international faces. And at, at the start of this pandemic, the palliative care world really came together. Um, I, I contacted people, for, uh, colleagues from Germany, from Italy, from Spain, in Wales here, we wrote a palliative pandemic plan and we shared those resources. And Christoph Osgarte, the president of the EAPC, shared with me some of the German responses to, uh, to, to, to palliative care. Um, and, and so I was lucky to have, have those contacts. But seeing all of you here makes me think I, I may be uh, writing a few emails to some of you because I'm sure you've got very good address books with the world of palliative care. And I think palliative care and public health must move together to, to, to coordinate such responses because 20 of us in different countries wrote palliative pandemic plans. Uh, they were all good in their own right, but maybe one uh, could learn from, from the other. And, and, and that's why an international effort can be so good and so collaborative in, in these difficult times. And sometimes when I look at the news, it strikes me we're all competing with each other. Which country is the best on the statistics? Who has got the lowest death rates? And, and, and that sort of competition focus, I think, doesn't work uh, in, in palliative care settings. Yes. Um, finally, and it's, this is just another voice, and this comes um, from a, a, a GP um, that I know. I run a, a little blog for BMJ Supportive and Palliative Care, um, which uh, if you Google, you, you, can, you can find. Um, and I'm just going to read you a small section of her blog of what she found. She works in a hospice of what she found there. Uh, this is by Dr. Anna Parry. It was easier to respond to the needs of patients than families in many ways. We were there with them. We sat with them and assured they weren't alone. Soothed them and talked to them when they wanted noise. Held silent when peace was best and reassured them how much those in their lives loved them. We heard their stories and learned what had shaped their journeys. But the barrier that COVID formed was still there. Ugly and blue material and plastic aprons and we cried at the end of each day against these new limitations on our care. For families, we became voices on the phone. We took time to make sure we rang at least once every day, describing in detail what was happening and asking for the information that would be used to make their loved ones as comfortable as they could be. Favorite radio stations, songs, passages of prose. How many sugars in tea, names of all the grandchildren, places they had traveled. But there were no reassuring hugs no held hands as we broke bad news, no searching faces during silence to respond to the unspoken questions. I don't think I could have put that any better. And it's another voice of so many voices. And if I could get people videoed, some of my patients or some of their family members, we could, we could have hours and days of, of, of videos of different experiences during this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You have published a very interesting article on the coronavirus pandemic, and about which is about uh, compassionate communities and information technology. I only recommend uh, all, uh, our uh, who are listening now to uh, check this uh, article because, as we could uh, hear now, we can have many kinds of statistics, but no statistics on on this issue compassionate which is compassionate community one so of the colleagues one of the uh, palliative care colleagues from italy 
uh, uh, said to me very quickly, get tablet computers, get laptops into your hospitals very quickly because people want to connect via video with their family members and set it up for them, make sure the Wi-Fi is working because that's where we struggled. We had, didn't have these things and people desperately wanted to see their families. And it is possible with modern technology to do this. Uh, we are all connecting here, but some people need help with that and it takes time. But that's what we did. We got lots of people bringing in you know, tablet computers and laptops and various things to the cancer center. It was a fantastic, compassionate community response. And we set up video meetings. I had one patient who, who, who basically um, said grace to his family from his hospital bed to, to the home where they were all sitting at a dinner table. And, and, and he was there with them on a laptop computer. Thank you very much. And now uh, I, we would like to hear some impressions from, from Claire. She represents a family doctor and a particularly younger group. As we know, probably all over the world, uh, younger physicians, younger staff, uh, younger work, uh, workforce sometimes can be the most flexible and most resilient. So we would like to hear your comments. Well, the most terrified. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I, it truly has been a, a unifying experience for all of us. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all my young colleagues around the world, because it was through our connections in our global WhatsApp groups as young GPs around the world that we were able to respond, I think, faster and more informed um, because of that, because of those connections that we had informally, which became lifelines to us during those periods of isolation. Um, I can relate so much personally and professionally to what's been said um, in the video and in Natasha's presentation as a GP working in South London um, during the pandemic, the peak of the pandemic here, or the first peak, uh, <laughs> uh, helping to establish the community COVID clinics, which we had, you know, where we saw work that would have taken years normally to mobilize happening in weeks. Um, it's been a very challenging time, balancing responsibility for patients, staff and family, working at home, um, consulting with patients while being quarantined with a toddler. Um, the fear and confusion from patients and colleagues as we scrambled to create a systematic response that was cohesive. Um, feeling disconnected from patients, as has been mentioned by a few people via PPE and technology and trying to find new ways to enhance communication and rapport, which, as you know, is such a vital part of all healthcare and, and particularly for me as a GP, I feel is, you know, my, my bread and butter, my greatest tool, uh, as Mark said. And I think our resilience, adaptability and capacity and tolerance has been tested time and again. Um, but I think most importantly, I've been absolutely humbled um, throughout COVID by the unity and the solidarity from, yes, my colleagues across the health and social care sector, but most importantly from our communities. Gowns being made by furloughed seamstresses that you, you, you meet through a mask in Tesco's shop, you know, visors being donated by local colleges and schools, community COVID support groups popping up everywhere, helping our isolated and quarantined patients. Um, and that gave me such hope. I'm working in our community hot clinic, as we called it at the time, or a community COVID clinic. Um, was one of the most humbling and empowering and inspiring experiences of my career so far. Working so closely in multidisciplinary teams, um, working so closely with care navigators and social prescribers, you know, the true value being revealed to many of my more resistant colleagues of how important it is for us to work in integrated care and to connect with each other. Um, so out of this, terror and horror, there is such great opportunity. I think as Natasha said, and someone from the video said, words like magnification and unmasked were used, but I, I would say highlighting the gaping inequities in our societies, um, both on, on the basis of a number of different things, demographics, um, long-term conditions, age. Um, but what a fantastic opportunity to show how inextricable and interdependent we are as a species. And if we can maximize on that, can we use that to advocate and to divert resources to the appropriate places um, of primary care, of the social care sector, of the third sector? Um, 
there's a lot of opportunity ahead if we have the strength and the foresight to harness it. Um, so I think that's all I'll say. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is really important to, to, uh, to hear all uh, reflections and emotions and also to hear that uh, many good things came out of this really not uh, uh, desirable situation of uh, COVID pandemic. And the last but not least, uh, I would like to ask uh, representative from Croatia on her brief response on the experiences. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want to express my pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, show and to see a very nice presentation from Natasha. And it is very important because it's uh, on the one place, very systematic and very good analysis of all situation uh, connected with COVID. Uh, in Croatia, we have a long tradition uh, with the primary care and also with the public health. And I think it's uh, the reason that we are very, I think so, very successful in uh, uh, controlling the COVID epidemic, in, um, especially in the uh, old people. Uh, and now um, I think it's a much uh, clearer the role of public health professional because we are the connection between people and uh, needs of people and uh, our colleague from clinic and also to politician. Uh, our experience, um, very long, we have a long experience uh, with collaboration with the social care and we also uh, now um, we, we also know that it's very important connection between health and social care system because if you want to control covid uh, epidemic uh, you need to support uh, social and also health uh, care to all the people uh, uh, what is very important uh, to uh, to say that to be in a peak of uh, epidemic in uh, April, uh, try to establish the new way of uh, recording data, especially on an area for the uh, city of Zagreb, uh, because we want to have a database with, uh, with uh, all people who tested and uh, positive on COVID and also to have opportunity to follow up the health uh, situation. And uh, what we uh, note uh, that people who live in uh, uh, nursing homes are uh, very um, they want to learn more about uh, new technology and a lot of them are very do use, use uh, new technology on a very on appropriate way and uh, also i would like to um, um, tell something about uh, data in our uh, what we note in the first way uh, that we have a much severe uh, patient in a, a elder but in a second way we have a lot of uh, older people who don't have uh, severe symptoms and now uh, we try to uh, to uh, because we want to, we, uh, if you have uh, all people who have positive test on COVID, uh, our uh, decision is to put in a hospital. Now we're thinking about some another system. Uh, I think that the role of, of a general practitioner is uh, very important because is the uh, primary care is the center for social and also health. Uh, care for the older people. Um, I think that I tell uh, enough okay. for the first time. Yes, thank you very much. So I, uh, I would like to hand the chair to Anya. Thank you very much, Antonia. So I'm very glad, panel, to be able to tell you that 
Um, our delegates were initially very shy, but the questions are now coming in thick and fast. So to all you delegates out there, get your questions in, please. We'd love to hear from you and hear your questions and your comments. So there are um, a couple of questions around calls to action. So if I can summarize the two questions, um, is there an opportunity to explore the tensions between national and international calls to action that will reach very local and perhaps neighborhood approaches or movements um, to integrating care? What are the panel's views on the, I suppose, the clash between all the different um, calls to action, uh, but also how can we take the best of those and make them real? And rather than going to each individual, if you just raise your hand, if you have um, something you'd like to say, Mark, I see your hand there. Yes, and uh, it's sort of prompted a little bit by something that Tanya just said. Um, I was in a, a national meeting yesterday about care homes. And I think what I would say in answer to your question, Anya, is to bring the outsiders in. Um, and uh, we all concluded that care homes are on the fringes at the moment. They're not really prioritized. Uh, there's no one who takes ownership for them in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a real it's a real issue. And I, I think that goes uh, primary care colleagues, secondary care colleagues. We, we all we all know that care homes are, are so important that we need to bring those people in and we need people in um, in, in government and in, in, in organizations like the WHO to have ownership of care homes and what happens there and give them super status and, and make sure that they're they're really covered and that they have palliative pandemic plans, pandemic plans, COVID plans, SARS plans, swine flu plans, wh whatever. And I, I think it's really sort of seeing who is, seems to have been under-prioritized here during this pandemic and not letting that happen again, learning from those le lessons because otherwise the next wave, it'll just happen again. Yes, thank you very much. And Josep, I think you wanted to say something. Yes, indeed, actually echoing what Mark was saying, that uh, there is an awful lot. Of course, we fall into a stereotype about uh, learning from each other, but it's more than a stereotype. There's an awful lot to be learned about these plans, particularly for nursing homes. But I wanted to take that in a broader issue as well. I think uh, in spite of the criticisms to WHO to one particular country or president in the globe, it's one thing uh, this pandemic has demonstrated is that we do need the role of WHO. We do need the role of the stronger European Union. At the moment, uh, we see uh, a myriad of, of traveling restrictions. We see a myriad of approaches to schools. We see a myriad of approaches to lockdown. Of course, no doubt this needs to be applied to the local situation, but some of the criteria and the evidence could be further standardized, aligned, and learning far more from each other than we that we done so far. So, if anything, actually, this uh, pandemic. One of the issues that um, this Pan-European Commission that Natasha was mentioning the other day. One of the issues that the commissioners already have raised in our last meeting with them was the need for international uh, governance, strengthening much more that international governance. More more than ever, subsidiarity doesn't quite work in these situations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other panelists wish to make a comment, Donald? Thanks, Anya. I just want to, in a sense, build on what uh, Marcus said. Obviously, as somebody representing the care home sector, I completely agree that care homes have been invisible. We have spoken and nobody has heard. We have raised our hands and nobody has seen. And that has been happening for decades. And in order for us to have a call to action, whether it's international or local, we have to have honesty. And it, it behoves the whole community to be honest in our conversation because change happens first when you listen and you see and you start to talk to one another. And the first step of honesty is to admit where we went wrong globally in our response to the pandemic. And one of the key marks of that was that we prioritised acute and emergency health services at the expense and at the cost of social care services. It did not take a rocket scientist to watch and see that millions were in danger in our long-term care institutions. 
Did we give priority to them? Did we prepare them? Did we listen to them? Sadly, the answer is no. And the silence of those who have died is the lesson which we all of us have to bear. So as we move forward, I don't want international calls for action which are fail at local level. I want my community to listen, to see, to act, and I want us all to have the humility to be responsible for our past actions and to be responsible for working collectively, internationally, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Tanya, I think you wanted to, sit, to come in. Yes, I would like to stress that it's very important to have guidelines from WHO and ECDC because uh, um, it is important to share our experience and uh, try to don't uh, repeat the some queries or some bad situation in other country to uh, put in our country. And I think that it's very important that we can uh, change our experience because to to encourage uh, ourselves to have energy to go further. Thank you very much, Claire. Sorry, am I on? Oh, yes. I can hear yep, thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Don Donald's word there, humility, which I think mm -hmm. is one of the most important words as we learn and recover yeah. from this. And dare I say, the suspension of professional egos, um, <laughs> if you'll excuse the turn of phrase, I think is vitally important. It's something that's been holding us back for a long time from integrating appropriately and prioritizing things the way they need to be done for patients, not the way they need to be done for professionals. Um, and I'm I'm so excited to see projects that have for a long time been poo-pooed and pushed to the side and talked about as being impossible, uh, now starting to be tested because of the urgency and unavoidability. The situation has created this malleable environment for change, this rapid catalyst. Of course, we need to balance that by ensuring that change actually is improvement. And I think that's yeah. where we need support and help for monitoring evidence, monitoring the implementation and the testing of changes that we make. But um, I'm locally, I've, we've seen projects starting up where all these missed outpatient appointments, instead of asking the patient, Malcolm and Barbara, to go to 10 different outpatient appointments, actually, why aren't we, the professionals, working together to come up with a plan and Malcolm and Barbara have one appointment, one point of contact where we provide them with a unified, comprehensive plan. That's patient-centred care and that's the opportunity that the urgency and all the missed um, health care that we've had during COVID has pushed to the forefront and made essential. And I hope that we can maximise on that. And as you say, that will take humility and it will take um, the suspension of that professional ego. But it will be, if we can do it, um, will revolutionise patient person-centred care for, for our communities. Couldn't agree with you more. And if I may um, uh, ask another question that has been raised and it builds on what the panel have been saying. So I'm hearing you say that listening, listening to people is really important. So how can we empower, as the person asks, patients and carers and support workers to be active participants in protecting their health and having confidence to ask questions? And they say that this can be overwhelming when we or someone we love is ill. Donald, would you like to start? Yeah, thanks, Aina. I think the first thing is that we have to learn their language. And it, it links into the humility thing, which is that we sometimes hide behind, whether in care or indeed in, in clinical service, we sometimes hide behind our expertise and our knowledge. But it's only as we get more experience that we learn that our knowledge and our skill comes through our ability to actually put ourselves in the place of the patient or the person being supported or cared for. And that means that when we talk about integration, we are seeing not our own defined positions or silos, but we're seeing the experience from that perspective of the individual who doesn't really care 
who employs you, what uniform you wear, what title you have, but actually cares not about your qualification, but about your humanity, your ability to relate to them as an individual. And I think if we learn nothing from the pandemic, we should learn the lesson that it is in that collective vulnerability of ourselves as professional carers and and a clinicians that we have that meeting place with those who come at real points of vulnerability. And I think, you know, that at our best, we are crossing a bridge to meet each other rather than expecting the patient or the carer to come into our world, learn our language and understand our systems. Thank you, uh, Donald. Joseph, I think you wanted to say something. Yes, briefly, and perhaps to be a bit devil's advocate, particularly in this group of so well uh, men and so involved so uh, individuals. I used to be a doctor, actually, by the way. You know what worries me, Anya, that uh, uh, so often we are in conferences and at the end of the conferences, someone says, you know, and the patient what? And everyone says rhetorically, the patient is at the center. We care about the patient, Malcolm and Barbara. I say Malcolm and Barbara myself. We did a whole review, whole studies coming out now, uh, looking at the actual evidence of what worked or doesn't work for that empowering. And of course, committed individuals like yourselves is what we need. But we need to go further than that. And humility is at the core is one of our main lessons as well. But we need to go further than that. We need to go into finding uh, quality assurance mechanisms that uh, incorporate the role of the patient in the e-health record. We need to find real tools in which the patient can be involved, can be really involved in that making decisions. We're not very innovative in this, in this area, really. When we talk about health literacy, I take these days about human resources, health resources literacy, doctor's literacy is as important. We need to learn their language, not their hours. Uh, payment systems and incentives also. So there's some interesting initiatives we've been looking at all over Europe. I'm, I'm not saying that that's the only way. I'm saying it's a, a range of areas. Payment systems like linked to the, to the PREMS, to the, the patient report experience. Even if the amounts are not very big, it's important that we highlight that the patient experience is very much important, is a part of that quality of care. So I think all of us in this field, we have to go beyond uh, the, the almost sort of signing the dotted line and saying we believe on that is important and so on, and really be much more hard on ourselves in putting in place hard mechanisms to put in place because empowerment is not happening. And I can assure you, I've seen empowerment in the last 15 years of my life in this profession or 20, and we don't see the changes happening at the, at the pace that our policymakers and some of the more uh, sort of uh, progressive individuals like yourselves or myself are saying, and that's very worrying. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, Claire, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to speak to the sort of the the simple things that we can do as well, just at our own local level when we're working with our patients locally. I mentioned before about the community COVID groups that we've seen mobilise, the self-mobilisation of our populations and communities um, to support each other. And, you know, I think that there's such opportunity there this, um, to, to tap into that motivation, that experience that people have had of giving, of reconnecting, of creating community again, where often community in our modern age has been something a bit more disparate. There's an opportunity to invite those people to engage further in patient participation groups, in, um, you know, in informing and engaging in how we deliver our care locally. Um, how we put things together. And that's certainly something that we're hoping to try and do is to tap into those communities, tap into the people who have raised their heads above the parapet, which have been innumerable people. And that really expands our demographic of the people who are traditionally involved in our patient participation groups. It's, it gives us a more, we've got an opportunity to diversify that input a little bit. And it's, it's a simple thing, but it could be so valuable in how we deliver things at a local level. Thank you very much. Um, now, I'm very conscious of the time and it's really important for all our delegates that they get a, a break. But I would like to invite a closing last thought 
from each of the panel members, please. And I'm going to invite in the order that I see you on my screen. So, Donald. I was hoping I would be the last to be seen. I'm oh, so sorry. Uh, given the focus of this, the, the conference, and given, I think, our collective agreement that integration and the working collaboratively of health and social care is of paramount importance. I, in a sense, go back to what I said earlier, which is that we've got to listen to each other and that there is a difference between hearing and listening. Because at the moment, I'm not convinced that we truly understand what the other does. And unless we do that, then what we will witness is globally the, clear, the clinicalization and medicalization of social care. Social care is distinct, it is different. It needs to be celebrated, it needs to be valued. It does not need to be absorbed to lose its identity, to lose its essence and creativity. It is only as we understand better what is the unique contribution of the individual, then we get true integration. So my plea would be, as we learn the lessons of COVID, that we learn the ability to truly understand what makes us different, unique, but also what makes us gloriously wrapped around the person. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Claire. Um, I think just to say that there's such great opportunity that lies ahead of us, but there's such great risk and we need to be very cautious of that. As humility dwindles, professional egos return, opportunistic vultures, dare I say, circle, um, and change progresses too rapidly to be checked and balanced and leaves some behind, thus expanding inequity rather than progressing it. We need to be very aware of these risks. Um, as we embrace opportunity, we need to make sure that we don't take our eye off the bigger picture. Um, and I hope that this community seems like the right community to do that. But as, as Joseph said, we need to make sure that we're speaking that up to power and that that is reflected in policy um, as well as what's happening on the ground. Thank you. Um, Joseph. Yes, actually, Claire, you said beautifully what I wanted to say. Let me tell you a secret, uh, Onion colleagues. My staff call me these days bipolar. Because some days I get up in the morning, I arrive to the office um, and, and I, I take what Claire was saying earlier. How do we harness this ingenuity, this community resources, this solidarity, this flexibility we see in this ability of our staff, the technology advances? I mean, we all heard that, but we have to highlight we've been years trying to put some of the telemedicine in place and it happened. In, in weeks in some places with payment systems and incentives. There's a stronger governance and national level and so on, which is now being lost uh, in Petit Comité. I cannot talk to countries, but many of uh, colleagues in ministers of health say we are now losing the ability to govern, to bring together because the wars of the COVID is over. Maybe they'll get it back now. Uh, so I feel so much possibilities and some other days I really don't see us harnessing that. I don't see us taking advantage of that. I don't see us making that sustainable. And I'll echo Claire again, although I enjoyed all of what you colleagues have said, I mean, is in the communication. So if I have to finish with something, colleagues, it's humility has been said already and communication. And how do we teach our policymakers to communicate uncertainty, could make realities, and teach them that a lot of what's happening now can be harnessed, can be used, if they're able to communicate, to provide incentives, to level with them. But it's not what I'm seeing so far. Uh, if I had more time, I'd like to tell you about some good experiences, some of the countries and some worse experiences. But uh, I'm bipolar, sorry. <laughs> I, I hope some days I'm like Claire, some of the days I, I, I feel much, much worse. <laughs> so I don't know. I hope for the best. Over. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Josep. And Tanya. Okay. I uh, would like to tell you uh, that uh, very important uh, from our experience is a very good communication between health system and social system because we have uh, we take care about uh, health condition in elderly and uh, I think that will be uh, 
successful if our communication will be much better. And also, I, uh, I very like this sentence, we have to build trust and we have to listening uh, people, but also I think uh, health and social uh, professionals and try to make uh, on a local uh, local level if you don't uh, if you couldn't change something on the national level you can do a lot of on the local level thank you thank you very much and last but by no means least um, mark yes um i think a lot of what i would have said as we'd already said uh, that makes it very uh, easy for me but uh, education and, and caps lock for me and the reason I say that is um, I, I see a lot of knowledge hierarchies and um, I, I may talk to a patient about a complex area like advanced care planning and ceilings of treatment conversations, for instance. Not, not an easy thing to talk about, visualizing perhaps your own dying moments, your own dying days and where there's, that those might be and, and what you, who you would want there. And, and those are not easy conversations to have. But the knowledge hierarchy is I, I know a lot about what typically happens in the last days and weeks of life and I try and transmit that and then my knowledge uh, lack is I don't know the person very well so I need to find out a little bit more uh, about them and that by no means is just patients carers that's also other people like paramedic staff I talk to nursing home uh, managers and, and various various others and I learn things from them and they learn things from me and so education is so important. I even talked to the um, health minister for, for Wales and he's got knowledge gaps that I can I can fill in. I hope he's not watching this. Um, and the uh, 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 chief medical officer for Wales as well. And then he tells me that things that I don't know about. So those knowledge, you know, hierarchies, if we can bring those together just a little bit more, then I think uh, everyone is a winner because patients and carers and, uh, you know, CMOs, and health ministers and, and everyone else, they get their information from various sources. Now, they, they say some patients and um, carers get their information from, from Twitter or from television. They've watched uh, um, um, medical soap operas. And, and that's kind of where they build their, their information from. And some of it is not always right, as we know. Uh, and so it, good knowledge, good information, good education is, is what I was bang the drum about, certainly for palliative care, but all areas of medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So on behalf of Antonia and myself as co-chairs of this session, um, we would like to thank you very, very much, Natasha and the panel, for your excellent contribution today. And without further ado, um, I advise us all to go forward humbly, and I'm going to hand you over to Fiona. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Amy. Bye. a marathon not a sprint although I will be asking you to sprint now to your next session um, I just want to let you know if you are watching through the live stream link you will need to log into the events on air portal to access the breakout sessions so they're going to be starting very shortly so go get a drink of water whatever you need to do and come right back at 11 15 thank you <laughs>